Hello and happy Thursday, everyone. Welcome to our live Q&A of Ask the Experts. My name is Heidi. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Manager at Supermove, and we're on a mission to make moving simple for everyone with a platform that brings your whole team to one system. So dispatchers, your trucks, your operations, your sales, all to one platform. And today I'm joined by Lauren McInnes and look forward to talking about structuring your team to scale. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, you know, different moving companies tuning in, small, big, maybe you're already a franchise, but Lauren definitely has that experience. So really excited to be able to learn from him. A uh, brief bio about Lauren. He's based in Vancouver, Canada, and is an entrepreneur with a systematic approach to equipping and empowering, empowering partners and employees with the tools necessary to become successful. And with his company, Ferguson Moving, his org charts are upside down with him at the bottom offering support. Under his leadership and with a team all aligned under a shared vision, the business has grown rapidly into a Canada-wide franchise. And he strongly believes that personal success is only achieved by helping others reach their goals. So we're here to learn from you how to structure your team to scale. And I'll start off by asking some of the submitted questions that came in during the registration. And for those tuning in, as always, type in your questions and we will turn to the Q&A uh, towards the end. So the Q&A is at the bottom of your control, the Zoom control panel. And yeah, we'll kick it off. Uh, Lauren, how did you get into the moving industry? And yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people didn't really get into the moving industry on purpose, right? That's something that I hear talking to a lot of people and I'm no different. Um, you know, I love learning, but I didn't do well in school. I struggled with sitting in a classroom. I wanted to be outside. And, uh, but I always had like, I always worked um, through school with part-time jobs. I did paper routes when I was younger than that. Um, I did a lot of uh, uh, things to just work when I was in school. But when, when school ended, a friend of mine was, uh, uh, his, his grandmother was passing away and uh, him and his mom were gonna go up near Alaska to a city called uh, Whitehorse to uh, make you know pay respects to her before she passed away and he asked me if I wanted to come and it would be for eight weeks and I talked to my mom about it and she didn't think it was a good idea and I just finished graduating high school um, I was about you know 2,000 miles away from home but I went anyway and I thought I'd had a lot of money saved up from working at a gas station I had $1,800 <laughs> and I had my own vehicle that I, that I took with me and I didn't realize the cost of living outside of your parents' house. Yeah. Uh, and that money only lasted maybe about three or four weeks or something, yeah. <laughs> and then I needed to get a job because I felt like if I called my, my family to ask for gas money to get home, they would kind of roll into the, I told you so. Yeah. And uh, so I started putting um, applications out everywhere and I got, uh, hired at a moving company when I was 19 wow. and started to work for them and learn the, learn the ropes all about the, the, the moving business uh, and, and worked there for about a year and a half. Wow. And then to CEO, awesome story. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I got into the moving business. I mean, that's as, as the entry point for it, but yeah, uh, yeah I, uh, after about a year and a half, I actually had a big disagreement with the owner of the company and I quit and it wasn't just that I quit I ended up leaving feeling like I can do this wow and my goal became to build a company so big that it would dwarf his like that's how upset that I was with like the things that uh had happened right yeah but, I gotta have that motivation uh, and uh, but I had no money so it's really hard to start a business with no money so what I did is on the weekends, I was already delivering pizzas for a local restaurant. And I thought, well, there's a lot of other restaurants in the city that don't do delivery. And, you know, but they have doggy bags and stuff with leftovers. So I started going around approaching them and asking them if they wanted to start doing deliveries. And uh, the, I had 22 restaurants say yes in the first week. And then I went and had a menu printed up with like all of their menus in it. And every time I would go back to doing my pizza deliveries, I would drop oh. off these menus. And uh, then I started getting more and more calls 
and then I had to hire like help people to help me. And so I was 20 at the time and I ended up having three drivers working like 4 p.m. till 1 a.m. doing deliveries wow. for all these different restaurants like Subway, Kentucky Fried Chicken and different places. So it's kind of like uh, Uber Eats or Skip the Dishes. Exactly. You know, type, type of thing. And, um, and, and so uh, I was doing that. And then after six months, uh, I ended up being able to afford to get my first moving truck. Wow. And I started to get contracts with different places like the post office. And uh, I was doing appliance deliveries for different places, doing household moves, doing office moves. So my first appointment was 7 a.m. to pick up mail, mail bags from the post office to take them to the government. Yeah. And uh, then at 4 p.m. I would switch to my food delivery business. So my hours of operation were 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. And I was working like seven days a week doing wow. that for a long time. It's interesting that the way that you started your company was with these contracts, these, you know, these partnerships. I feel like a lot of people start by moving their friend and then they just jump into residential. So um, yeah, no, that's, that's really fascinating uh, to jump. You know, I want to fast forward to, to, you know, you now Ferguson moving. I'm curious, when did you think about turning Ferguson into a franchise and what were the beginning days like when you created your, you know, your, your, your first franchise? Sure. So, um, I, I, I bought into the business. I got into the company in 2001 after moving back to Vancouver and, and by 2004, uh, we had already transformed the company from where it was because it was only about a three truck business, but it was already something like 90 years old. Yeah. Um, but it was like a second generation owner that had it and he was doing everything by himself. And it was really like the inmates were running the asylum uh, for, for the business. Uh, but I, you know, a lot of people would come into that company and then turn around and walk out the door because it just was chaotic. Um, but I saw like good potential because even though there was dysfunction uh, with the age of the company, it was still garnishing Incredible. large clients to move and, and big houses and stuff. And that was the most important thing. And so we started to, to systematize the business with just the, the simple things of, uh, and I actually, I started there as a driver because I was just going to start up my own company. But um, I went to the owner and just thanked him for the hours. And I let him know that um, this was like two weeks into working there as a mover, um, that I, I'm probably going to move and, uh, start up my own company again, but I thank, thanked him for the hours, but I saw he was doing everything himself. So I said, if you ever need a hand doing sales, I've done like hundreds of, uh, uh, sales appointments myself. So if you ever need a hand, let me know. And he called me that night and said, uh, that he talked to his wife and that he would like a hand. <laughs> and I said, you know, you also need help with operations because, uh, there's a lot of issues like the trucks, like they're not, it's not being run well. Like you open up the door and a beer can rolls out, like that's not good. Right. Yeah. Um, so after two weeks, I was the sales manager and the operations manager for the company. And that's where it really gave me the free reign to make the right. changes. And, uh, so we uh, started to work on personnel changes, uniform changes, getting new trucks, uh, improving the sales processes and, right away, like we'd gone from doing 300,000 a year to a million a year wow. sales. And then we had sold out of like the storage that he had and uh, we needed to get into a bigger facility. Um, and he'd always known that I wanted to buy into the company. So in order to move into the larger facility, uh, he wanted me to buy half the company. So I bought 49%. And then we ran it for a number of years. And then uh, in 2010, uh, he was retiring. So I bought out uh, the balance of it and it was kind of around that time I was already thinking of like franchising because we had everything in play mm -hmm. and so I had my first franchise disclosure document created and I went through it and, and then I realized I'm actually not ready to franchise because there's too much in my head of how everything runs and you know I'm kind of the wizard of Oz like with people coming and asking questions and so I actually stuck the document in my drawer for the next two years uh, to get more things out of my head, documented as processes and systems that other people could be trained on and follow so that we could uh, expand and grow. And that's really where I've started to work on more like uh, on the development of the franchise at that time before I brought anyone on. I wonder why it's not so common to document 
processes for people. You know, like you said, everything was in your head. It was just experience. You, you knew how to put out fires. You knew how to you know, do the sales operations. Um, but I'm sure a lot of moving companies are in the same situation where things aren't documented. So they have no success plan, succession, succession plan. Yeah. Well, that so, was me though, because I was like a very, and I still struggle with this at times. Like I'm, when you start off a business, you need to know everything about everything, right? You need to know that truck over there. It's got a slow leak in the front right tire. And if you don't fill it up every three days, you're going to have a flat that times a million, right? And yeah. so you got all this stuff kind of going on and it's very hard to uh, let go of that and give a, give a truck to somebody and you know, you start feeling like you have to overwhelm them with information. They haven't even left the bloody parking lot and you've given them like 18 things that they got to watch out for with that, with that truck or that job or that customer. And it, it, it it's a ceiling for your growth. And I think it does, it, it takes until you realize you're not going to grow anymore as a company or as a person on your own before you kind of hit that. So yeah, I, I struggled with that for a long time. You know, that's where I was, I was putting in like tons of hours and stuff like that but it, once once you kind of realize that you're not going to be able to grow from a million to two million to three million to four million uh that was it, it, it's still it still is a struggle for me like because i still have that tendency at times but i need to uh just get away document everything get it out of my system and so i'm i'm a lot better at uh at it now but you know, even when we opened up our first call center, I didn't like the way that people were answering the phone. Mm. And they would say things like, ah, oh, why did you say that? And just, you know, any owner will understand like it kind of these cringe moments. And so instead of like documenting and making scripts at that time, what I started doing is, oh, I'll pick up the phone and I'll talk and let You'll them be the see, one. like model for yeah. them how it's done. And, and I think like it just makes things worse, right? That you don't empower people. And so when we started to create scripts for uh, this is what to say, train on the scripts and then empower people on how to be successful at the role and they actually can improve on the scripts. I've come back into the office since then and hear people on the phone now and wow, they, I could never be as good as that. Like they wow. are really excellent. So did it, did you get to a point of burnout until you started delegating or, you know, realizing like you can't be the one that's doing, run, running everything, being in charge of everything? I don't know if I would call it burnout. I would think that uh, I just realized that I'm not going to be able to grow. Like mm. I, I think like if I'm the center of the stage, like if it's a performance, right, then I'm always going to have to be there. But I realized through um, putting other people on stage, giving the, putting them in the line, giving them the credit for the success yeah, and letting them grow. Uh, that's really where you can start to see that the company grows. And that's where I actually, I get more excited now about the success of people on my team or my franchise owners than I am even about my own personal achievements. Mm. Because you're able to, I guess, create more change or influence more people, create, you know, change more people's lives? It ends up like for me now, it's a philosophy of like, I don't do any deal unless it's a win-win. Like you win, I win, everybody <laughs> wins. I don't do any deals where you win, I lose, I win, you lose. I don't, yeah. I don't do those anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we were talking, uh, you, you mentioned that a lack of structure creates a need to rely on the experts. Um, so how do you make sure that once you do have structure and processes that those stay in place? Or is yeah. that something you're, you guys review, you know, constantly change? Yeah. So when you put processes in place, the way that you deal with like making sure it's in place is the reports that you get, right? So I get different reports from different heads of different departments. So every day I'll get a, a operations report. Every day I'll get a call center report, sales report, and these are reports that are coming to me that other people are assembling. And on top of that, it's the regular meetings that we have, right? So we'll have like our weekly sales meeting, our monthly management meeting. And so these can be done on Zoom or anything. But the point is, is that you stay connected and um, you have a, like we have an agenda that we go through. Yeah. I really want to keep my meetings as short as possible. So um, on you know, track, on track. And so that's where like having an agenda of what do I want to accomplish 
And even with my reports, I wanna make sure that the reports that I'm getting aren't just a bunch of numbers that I don't look at. I wanna make sure that they have meaning. Anyone that's ever done any search engine opt optimization that gets a report from those companies, you, you know, you get these like 20 pages and I've, I've been there where I get these monthly reports and I don't even know what nothing. they mean and don't look at them and delete them and stuff like that. So I wanna make sure that the reports that people are taking their time to put together for me are, uh, are impactful. Have you always been very data driven or is that something that you've adopted? That's something that I've adopted. Yeah. I think even in my first few years of business, like as a young 20 something, um, I just thought that I'll just charge what everybody else is charging or a little bit less so that I can get some business. And as long as I'm busy, then I'll be making money. And it wasn't until probably my third year where I was just like sitting in my chair exhausted. And I, I got my financial reports from my bookkeeper who have made it like, uh, he came into your office because uh, he was just a small business and you know give me the reports and just that feeling of frustrated like is he stealing from me you know is my, is my bookkeeper embezzling money because like where's the money it says it says here that I, I made money and then I checked the bank and there's nothing in it like where's the money and so I think that it's that um that failure of a business almost of falling forward that creates that need to find out why and there's got to be a better way. And because we, you know, anyone in this business works really hard. So you want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, making money, making money on it. Yeah. Uh, I, you can start with any, any part of your business, but what processes have to be set in order to start scaling? Oh, okay. So it, it really, I, I would say everything kind of needs to go up together, right? So processes for sales, marketing, operations, accounting, um, everything needs to scale at the same yeah. time, right? Because if you have like your sales explode, then you, you, you're getting like a ton of customers, but if your operations isn't keeping up, then you're, all your customers that you're getting, you're losing them on the back end through your mm -hmm. operations. And so I think for, in, in order to scale, it starts with a vision of what you want, you know? And it sounds like a big like cloud statement to say, but to break it down, you know, um, how, much, how much money do you wanna make? And then also what people need to realize is like, what are you willing to give for that money? If you wanna make a hundred million dollars, what are you willing to give to get that? Like sacrifice? What sacrifice or spend? You make? Yeah, and mm -hmm. so like think of like your, your family as well. Like how much time do you wanna spend with your family? Um, because entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. And some people would actually make more money with a job and have more time with their family. Uh, so I think it's making sure that you have a vision of what you want. Do you want three trucks? Do you want four trucks? Do you want a storage mm. facility? Do you want to get a million dollars a year? Do you want to get 500,000 a year? You know, uh, what is it that you want? And then once you have that in mind, then you can start to look at where are the biggest problems, right? So if you're having, if your books, you feel like your books are a mess, I would start there. If you feel like your books are fine, but your, your phone's not ringing, I would start with marketing, mm -hmm. right? Because I remember in those early days, like I had a, a real desire to get more people to, to move with me. And I thought putting an ad in the yellow pages uh, would just make the phone ring instantly when it came <laughs> out and it didn't work, yeah. right? And so I, uh, I had really no money. So if I didn't get moves, I didn't eat. I was putting fuel in the truck instead of food in my fridge oh, wow. and um you know sacrifices I took the, yeah and I, I i took the the yellow pages ad down to the office depot photocopied the yellow page ad and then i drove around and put them into mailboxes with for sale signs outside and so that's hustling Jeez. You know, and, and then uh i would start uh, and then i would also leave like a box and uh, like a, a moving box, box? A moving box with uh -huh. a roll of tape with my flyer on it, right? So make it stand out more. Like here's a free box, here's a free roll of tape, and here's my flyer. And if I went around and dropped off like 50 flyers, I would usually get about uh, three or four moves from it. Wow, that's a the a tactic that I've never heard of. And I do you still do that? I feel like that would definitely make you stand out. No, I don't. I don't do that now. <laughs> but you know, again, like it, even when I was in people's houses if they didn't choose me i would just like 
persevere. Review, review, like play it like a movie in my head, like why, 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 why? And just started to refine my my skills in in sales. You know, but yeah. it was it was really like I was just super driven for making sure that um I was winning the moves, right? And that yeah. I would do do a really good job on the move that I won. Um uh, a question about, you know, this past year, last year with the labor and driver shortage, how has, how has that affected your business? Yeah, it's been a real challenge for um, a couple of things where, again, like sales has exploded and then getting yeah, operations capacity. to kind of keep up with it, right? With the labor shortage, we're turning down right now, even uh, I get it in my daily reports. Uh, yesterday, we turned down six jobs, but on average, we're turning uh, about 10 to 20 jobs a day down. Um, and so our focus is, okay, let's get more more staff. And normally, you could place ads all over the place, and you would get a lineup out the door of people that are going to work because the moving industry typically pays more than a lot of other industries, whether it be like in the restaurant or hotel, hospitality industry space, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a harder job, but with paying more money, you attract uh, more people. But yeah, that's been that's been a real struggle. Um, but again, we look at how do we how do we innovate, how do we rise above that? Um, and one of the things that we've done recently that I would encourage other people to do, I own another business now called um, Express Employment Professionals. So it's a staffing agency, and so I know how that entire industry yes. works. Mm. And so what I what I'd normally do is have them find me people and then we would interview them. And then if we like them, we would bring them on. But what would happen is my staffing agency would already do the interview. And then by the time we asked them to come in for an in-person interview with us, there's like a huge percentage of people not coming in, mm. right? Because um, they maybe find something a little easier or whatever, like they get a job somewhere else. And so what I, I came up with is let's stop doing that let's have like um, every two weeks, one day where we bring in as many people as possible from staffing agencies. So I went to mine and I even went to a couple of my competitors Yeah. and I said, I need to get drivers and movers. And they say, how many? And I say, I need 40, right? Like, oh, wow, 40. Okay. Yeah. And then, so people start assigning like specific people in their offices to uh, work on your account because that's a big order, right? And so what they do is they send people down so we can have uh, 10 people come in. But instead of it being for an interview, what we're saying is training no, job. This is, this, is, this is paid, right? So you're just coming in for orientation, right? And then we'll put you to work. And so you have 10 people show up. And then what we do is we run through a script of um, welcome to the company, give a little bit of history, talk about what we do. We give examples of people that have risen in the company from like being a mover to being a franchise owner or working in the trucks and now they're in operations or getting into sales positions and you know talking about this different salaries that these people uh, earn. Um, and then we also talk about like the difficulties of the job, right? Like lots of overtime, different start times, uh, working in inclement weather, heavy lifting uh, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. then we ask everybody there, like, if you're still interested, um, you know, we'll meet one on one with each of you. And for those of you that are still here, there's, you know, refreshments, there's coffee and water. And remember, this is paid time. If you feel this isn't for you, uh, feel free to withdraw your um, application and we'll pay you for your time that you came in today. Interesting. And, and wow. Then, so that first first meeting with that possible new mover, new hire is paid. It's paid. Yeah. Wow. It's paid. And so uh, it actually turns out to be a lot cheaper than people think because I was spending about $6,000 a month advertising for staff and getting really dismal results. Applicants. Wow. Right? And for um, a recruiting agency, like uh, there's 800 express offices throughout like the US and Canada. Um, and we're just like one of the franchise owners of that business. And it, it makes a lot of sense to let them do all the work place because you can go on to these, you know, indeed Definitely. and stuff like that. Yeah. And you can post a thing and you'll, you'll get like maybe a lot of applicants, but then somebody's got to spend time to go through those, read those, call those, set up uh, phone interviews. It's a, it's a lot of work, right. Yeah. And then check references. So I outsource all of that, get all these people to come in, 
and then we will do the uh, you know the script that I talked to you about. And then for those that make it through the one-to-one -one interview, which is just 15 minutes of sit-down questions, making sure they're a good fit, then we'll bring them all in together. And now we'll do a review of the job description. Uh, we'll go over the terms and policies of the company and all of the things that they need to know. And then we have online training through Trainual. So we'll sign them all up for Trainual. We'll send them home and we'll let them know we're gonna give them one extra hour to complete the Trainual stuff at home. And then uh, they're gonna come back in the next day and then I introduced them to one of our top movers who's like our, our trainer. And then he works with them in the warehouse with no customer around because there's yep. always a lot of work to do in the warehouse. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then he takes them through like uh, three days of training in the warehouse um, before they ever get to go and see a customer, right? But it's just something new that we're trying now um, because we are struggling with getting staff. But you, we, we, you know, we have to ask ourselves, okay, how much effort are we putting into getting staff? Right? True. And I think it was coming down to like on a scale of one out of 10, we're maybe doing a four. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if we're doing a four, what else can we do? And that's really where people that are business owners, that's where our value is as, as the entrepreneurs that we come up with the ideas. It's very hard to turn to your staff and say, hey guys, what are we going to do? What, yeah. Right, because it's not their business. Like, well, I don't know what we should do. And, <laughs> and, and so- uh, you know, again, like I can come up with the idea, but I got to document it, model it, show it to somebody else. And that's what I'm working on recently is to be able to pass that off so that I'm not the one doing it. That sounds like a very creative idea that I've also not heard anyone try, but you know, in terms of how much effort are you putting into, you know, hiring? I know there's a lot of people that talk about how difficult it is, but they don't have enough funds to have you know, pay for an HR person or invest more into who they're outsourcing or staffing for the staffing agency. Yeah, so, with staffing agencies, you don't have to pay them like, um, you know, $10,000 finder fee for a person because they have um, evaluation to hire services. So mm -hmm. you're, only, you're, you're only paying like an extra three or $4 an hour uh, for the person that they bring in versus doing it yourself. But then it's a nice trial thing. And if it's not working out, you don't even have to sit down with the employee because it's not your employee yet. You can just call the recruiter and say, you know, Jeff isn't working out. And then you'll just never see Jeff again. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, I got this question from a from someone that registered. Uh, what kind of tech tools do, do your teams use? You, know, you talk about reporting. Obviously, there's got to be tech in place in order to get those clean reporting points. Um, and also, do your companies all run with the same software? Oh, the various companies that I own? Um, no. All the franchises. Oh, yes, they all they all run on the same software. So we have our, our CRM, we have uh, GPS tracking on all our trucks. Uh, we also use a system called uh, uh, Workplace, which is a paid service of Facebook. And so with Workplace, um, it doesn't connect people to their Facebook account, right? So they create their own account mm -hmm. and it's somewhat like Facebook and you can post videos and everything in there. So for example, like our sales staff, uh, one of the things that we ran into a long time ago was our sales staff can go out, they can take great notes of the move details of what the, the move looks like, mm -hmm. but we found that it doesn't cover the nuances of who the customer is. So what we did is every time like a customer books, our sales staff bring out their phone and then they do a one minute customer introduction video of, you know, maybe it's like, um, oh, we're moving Mrs. Anderson. She's 80, 80 years old. She hasn't moved in 45 years. She's very nervous about everything. There's some rose bushes out front that she's particularly concerned about. So please put a ramp over the rose bushes so that we don't trample them. And, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's in our hands and she's just relying on us to take care of everything. So please make sure before you guys uh, finish that you ask her, is there absolutely anything else that we can do to help you uh, to make sure that she's looked after, right? Just that one little thing, like it's, 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 it's a lot better to do it that way than it is to no, type all that out, right? <laughs> but it doesn't have, it doesn't carry the same meaning. Wow. I, that's a really interesting, yeah, a really interesting idea, especially because I, I think people glaze like the, the crew, right? They'll just glaze over the notes because there's so much to read through. 
um, you know, the start of the job, they're probably just, you know, overwhelmed, but to make it easy, have a video for them to watch. That way you can say, well, it's been communicated. Yeah, it's been communicated, but also I think like for the movers, it's a real disadvantage for them because they're every day going to a different job, right? They don't and know. So for them, yeah. for them, you know, uh, it, it, they don't know who they're kind of, what type of customer, you know, is the customer like a director where they're going to tell you everything to do? Are they passive where they're not really sure what to do and they're not giving any direction? Or are they like a socializer where uh, they won't let you get to work because it takes two hours just to do the walkthrough of the house because they're telling you all kinds of stories. And so we really need to let our moving staff know what they're walking into. And then we, we teach them and coach them through our training on how to deal with the three different personality types. Wow. You can uh, summarize the personality types by emojis, like a fire yes, emoji. That's right. Personality <laughs> that's face. I'm going to write that down. Or, that's <laughs> or a giant X. I'm just kidding. You probably <laughs> wouldn't send your crews to a right. bad customer. Uh, do you find that it's hard to train your new movers and your new staff, the technology that you guys are using? Actually, I find it getting a lot better and easier um, as time goes on. And really that's where we try and find tools that are trainable, right? That um, are easy to understand. I like as many tools that kind of look similar to Facebook as possible. Very easy, transparent, cloud-based. Uh, you can view it on your phone and it's, it's very easy to train. And I think that as time goes forward, it's just gonna get easier and easier and easier. Yeah, no, I, I like that comparison. Every, you know, everyone's on Facebook. For the yeah. most part. Well, you've seen um, that there, there's even different tools out there that we've tried. And if they don't look good, like Microsoft Teams was one, you know, um, so workplace costs us money. We were going to switch to Microsoft Teams because it's already included in our Microsoft Exchange fee. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not free, but you're already paying for it. But, you know, it's there. But it didn't have that same dynamic easiness and look to it. And it was just a huge fail. And because the workplace one used to be free and then they started charging money for it. So that's where we were like, oh, do we want to pay so much per user? But it ended up being a worthwhile expenditure. Yeah, everyone's going to start using workplace. I've never even heard of it. So I'm definitely going to look into it. I think Facebook is going to own the world someday. But yeah. um, uh, on top of being a moving company owner, this is my last question before we go into Q&A. If anyone else wants to type in your questions, thank you, Kevin. Uh, on top of being a moving company owner, you run four other businesses. What have you found to be the biggest challenge in each business? That's oh. kind of, that might be like a very detailed question. Yeah, that's okay. No, I think, I think the, the, the biggest challenge in each business is uh, scaling for growth, right? So mm -hmm. again, it's like all the different parts of the companies that are going up, whether it's like sales, marketing, operations um, of the business or like accounting. And so once you learn these skills in moving, you know, um, you'll be surprised that you actually, these are very transferable skills to other businesses. So one of my other companies that I own with a business partner, it's a landscaping business. I know really zero about how to pull weeds and mow lawns and do all of the, you know, hedge trimmings and everything like that. But, you know, we've got a staff of 35 people that, that, that they know what they're doing. And so we cultivate um the business for growth by bringing in people but not necessarily saying like you tell us what to do this this is what we need and then you know we've been growing that business for the last uh, six years and now now I, I i have a really good handle on the structure of how the company needs to run but i still don't know how to operate a hedge trimmer all right, so the you're I'm sure you have all these other business ideas you're gonna jump into like start a start a pizza store or some pizza company or something. Oh, I never want to have a business with an expiry date. Oh, that's, interesting. That's one thing that scares me. I, I I tell my wife never let me get into a food business, please ever. <laughs> Ice cream. No, no, or, no. or Twinkies. Twinkies okay. No, no. Oh, Twinkies. Yeah, maybe okay. I'll get into Twinkies. Sure. They last forever. All right, uh, I'm going to start with Kevin's question. Uh, in today's moving world, every company needs cash flow to survive. So, how would you evaluate how much working capital you need to get the business up and running and begin building it? 
Well, it depends on your personality and where your circumstances are, right? Like if you're single and 20, like I said, like I, I, I put fuel instead of food in, you know, in my, in my expenses. But uh, I would say if you want to do it smartly, instead of doing it like a 20 year old, um, you really want to have a good idea of what your monthly overhead costs are going to be. What, so if you have no moves scheduled whatsoever, what are your monthly overhead costs? So your, your truck payments, your insurance, rent, um, any salaries that you have, what are those expenses? And I think you really want to have at least six months of working capital available uh, to cover your overhead costs. So if you end up having no moves whatsoever, and that was actually something when COVID first hit, I thought a lockdown meant that nobody would be moving. And so I went through with our uh, accountants uh, to look at, okay, if we have to lay everybody off, shut everything down, but keep all the necessary payments going, what is that number going to be? And so that's, that's what I would recommend is having at least minimum three months of uh, uh, working capital available, ideally six months to have enough of a cushion. All right. Thanks, Kevin, for that question. Uh, Slava is asking, hi, Lauren, can you talk about uh, independent contractors versus employees? Yeah, so independent contractors versus employees. Um, if you're talking about like how to pay people, you know, um, I would. I, would I think that. I think mainly independent uh, or contract movers versus full time, full time uh, crews. Sure. Well, uh, for us, like we mainly just have like our own staff. The thing with independent contractors. Do you really know how they operate, right? Are they going to your customer and saying, next time call us, we're cheaper? Are they um, treating your customer the way that fits in with the way that you would treat the customer yourself if you were there? Mm -hmm. I would say if you're going to work with someone that's got like their own truck and they're doing stuff like that, you also need to be upfront with the customer that you're doing that because um, I don't do that myself. But if, if you are open to doing that, just make sure the customer is on the same page as you. Um, sometimes I see things on Facebook, like, oh, I need three guys to help me unload in Alabama tomorrow. Anyone that could help me. Can you imagine the horror that the customer would feel if they saw that ad? I never see any of the movers tagging their customer into that post, <laughs> right? Like, oh my God, Jim can't find three guys to help us unload tomorrow. Who, yeah. who is he going to get? What are these people going to look like? How are they going to act? And I think you need to have that same kind of paranoia as your customers have when you're talking about independent contractors. And I would make sure that you even go and watch the work that they're doing on their own jobs or with somebody else and uh, just do a site visit. Hey, if you wanna be an independent contractor for us, that's great. Uh, let me know the next three jobs that you're on. I wanna just come by and see them or send somebody by and then have a checklist ready when you go there of like, what is it you're looking for? Don't just wander in, you know, even if you have an app or a clipboard, are they using floor runners? Are they pad wrapping the furniture? Are they labeling the boxes? Um, you know, are they setting things up the way that ideally you would like to as well? And then you can engage them into uh, working for you as a contractor, but you gotta be really clear with everybody because it can get you into a lot of trouble if you just rush into it with dollar signs that I'm gonna make more money. I don't have to turn down as many jobs, right? Because your, your reputation uh, can get damaged. Yeah, it's like a quality versus money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and sometimes as well, like depending on how you set it up, um, the contractor, the, the contract workers that you're dealing with, they know that you're making money off of the services that they're doing and they can start to feel like, why am I giving you any money? Because they don't sometimes realize that you're trying to run a business, you did marketing, you did the sales, like you spent a lot of time to get this customer. And for example, if uh, you're invoicing the customer a thousand dollars, but they're getting 600. They might, they, I've seen that before where they start to question like, why am I giving you $400? <laughs> and uh, so it, it, it can, it can get toxic unless you got everything thought out well in advance. Yeah. All right. Slava, I'm going to ask one of your, one more of your questions and then I'm going to wrap, wrap it up. But uh, which GPS tracking have you tried? Uh, which one are you currently using? So I'm, I'm using one here called Posi Trace. 
and uh, they have I've never a, heard of that. No, it's it's a it's a Vancouver based one. It's really inexpensive. So in probably U.S. dollars, it's about eighteen dollars a month, and so they give you the unit for free based on putting it in as a contract. I think for three years, and so we just pay uh, pay that, and it's really good online uh, tool, and they. Um, yeah, it's just been one that I've been super happy with, super easy to use. Using local tools, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lauren, well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to me, answer some questions, and really just, yeah, shed some knowledge with us. Uh, and for, just wanted to close it out by saying that for anyone who did tune in, uh, if you're interested in learning more about Supermove, please check out our website. You can sign up for a demo and we're looking to be the best moving software out there. So see what we have, see what you see, check out what we have and hopefully we can wow you. Uh, Lauren, do you have any last words before I end the session? I just am really, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you. And I really enjoy like um, giving back to wherever I can for the people that are coming behind me. And uh, I want to acknowledge as well, like all the people that helped me uh throughout my struggles because there's been a lot of a lot of people that have helped me so uh you know i i really hope that in our industry that we lean on each other more for support i think there's a lot of competitiveness within our business um, especially with like somebody that's more local uh to us and i would say that i've gained a lot by reaching out to my local competitors and then um with them like referring work to me and me referring work to them. So really uh, keep supporting each other because there's plenty of enough work for all the good guys to go around. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, even from me being on the tech side of things, I, I see that there is a lot of competition and, but there are also plenty of people that are very friendly in sharing their knowledge, like Lauren, like Kevin. Um, so, yeah, I, I love I love that that's you know you, you're very grateful for everyone that's helped you and that you want to give back. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you all for attending. <laughs> I see that there's some more questions, but <laughs> Jeff, if, Jeff Slava, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out, Lauren, if that's okay. Reach out Absolutely, to me. Absolutely, yes. Out to Lauren. Uh, I'm on uh, I'm on Facebook. If anyone wants to reach out, uh, you can reach me there. Awesome. Um, but yeah, thank you all for attending and look out for our next event by following Supermove on the social media channels. Well, Thanks, have buddy. a great day, Lauren. You too. All right. Bye, everyone.